This is, and the evidence as we've seen, you know, if you look carefully, uh, it's there for a lot of people to have seen. Mm -hmm. Of course, I attribute whatever insight I've had to an answer to prayer. So as a result of it not getting out, you're going public, you're trying to help people know about it, and you have uh, developed a website mm -hmm. that puts the very technical information for people that really want to look closely that I read some of the abstracts and I can assure you uh, that it's technical <laughs> it has all the mathematics and different things and it's right there it's the same papers that have the 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 fact that you know that they were accepted by that email what's that server that archive that the archive they accepted the they got the papers they gave you a number and said we see it and they were about ready to send it out but then they didn't so uh, you have all those there, people can read them, they can get the information, they can see how all these problems are solved, and it's out there. Yes, uh, let me just go through very, very quickly. These 10 papers that... These are the titles. That's right. Um, part one is the scientific community in for a big surprise. Okay, and this first paper then showed, hey, look, there's problems with the Big Bang, we need to look at it, in for a big surprise. That's right. The next and one... And then the next one was... Is the scientific community aware of the extraordinary confusion over Big Bang's expansion redshifts? And of course, some of them are. I mean, you document that, but largely people that are coming into the, the in shoot of science, the graduate students, the others, they, they're not aware of it, and so you're letting them know what it took you years to discover. Absolutely. Uh, the very fact is, you know, what I do in that particular paper is to quote one authority versus another authority and show, of course, All they don't even agree. And the third one was galaxies point to flaws in Big Bang's, Big Bang's expanding balloon illustration. And that's what we just covered earlier. The that's one with right. the balloon with the pennies on it doesn't make sense that the pennies wouldn't expand as the balloon did. And then uh, the fourth one, tell us about that one. Well, that's what we've already talked about. Uh, Space-time expansion requires wavelengths to expand. And indeed, if there was okay. a Big Bang fireball, all these photons... You know, they had to expand, it lost energy, and indeed 30 million times the mass of the universe is what the gargantuan non-conservation of energy losses would have been. And the next one, number five. Oh, that's the one that uh, we don't have time to delve into right now. The relativistic operation of the GPS exposes the fatal flaw in Big Bang's cornerstone expansion hypothesis, hypothesis or postulate. Basically what it amounts to is that the operation of the global positioning system yeah. uh, depends on the operation, depends on general relativity. Mm -hmm. General relativity is what they say, it's the solution of the field equations, is what they say is behind this space-time expansion. So general relativity then, the kind they were using, says a certain prediction should be occurring as a result of the operation of the global positioning system. David and I looked at the operation of the global positioning system and we found that it doesn't fit the space-time expansion paradigm at all. It fits the static space-time expansion back in 1917, the one that Einstein, Einstein came up with. So it, it fits that, and it also fits your uh, model of the universe that has some kind of border that's right. to it. Okay. And it that's, conserves energy. All right. It conserves so that, energy. That's number five. And all, the, uh, and all of the research is right there. The number six, the ultimate disproof of the Big Bang comes from its bizarre prediction that photons, photons are prematurely inscribed with H's value at time of origin. I don't explain all, all right. understand very, all very that. Very quickly. Here's, okay. Very, very quickly. You have a memory. I have a memory because we have a memory bank, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if I tell you, though, that these light particles, photons, are coming from these lamps right here or anywhere else in the universe, if I tell you that one of us comes from there to here and it has a memory of when it was formed and it retains that memory and it's going to change now <clears throat> depending on when it was formed. <coughs> Pardon me. In other words, let's put it this way. The theory which no one else had discovered before we wrote this particular paper was that the photons that were formed back at the Big Bang, in order to fulfill exactly what Big Bang has to say, they have to remember when they were formed, what the value of the Hubble constant was at the time they were formed. Then they've got to change wavelength from that time to this time right here, knowing how long, how far back it was when they formed. No one else had ever discovered this before, and that's what this particular paper is all about. In fact, that's the paper which I have on the CERN archive as well. And again, nobody's saying anything about it. Okay, number seven then. Discovery, 
or discover of a nearby universal center is a smoking gun signature of Genesis, in other words, your model of the universe, That's right. that over, overturns Big Bang's cosmological principle. Okay. In other words, you got a center, there is a specific place in the universe, the, play, the universe is not the same everywhere, and indeed, I go through the evidence there showing there is this nearby that. center. And then uh, this is something to do with a technical point where basically... Genesis is strongly affirmed because it's MZ, Delta, Theta, Z, and apparent brightness relations are consistent with observations. In other words, there are predictions that, you know, you look out in the universe and you see the brightness of a galaxy at a certain redshift. Okay. Well, there are things that determine or relate to that depending on the model of the universe you have. You look at the prediction, then you look at the actual observation. So you just and go through those and document how it answers those questions. Right. And then number nine, this proof of Big Bang cosmology points to seven smoking gun signatures of Genesis astrophysical framework. So again, looking at other considerations. Well, once you go through, right, once you go through and show why the Big Bang is based on incorrect premises, then you can take the, abs the observational data, put it in the other framework, and show See if basically, it works. And, and show it that indeed that it works. That's okay. basically it. And then, and then uh, this one, absence of population three stars, prior discovery of short half-life, extinct primordial radioactivity, disproving, disproved Big Bang's nucleosynthesis synthesis scenario, and substantiates Genesis' rapid creation postulate. Population three stars are presumed to be the stars that form just of hydrogen and helium. They have never been found. Okay. And they should have been found. They've never been found. They keep asking why and why, why do we not see population three stars? And the extinct primordial radioactivity is the polonium halo evidence in the granite rocks. Okay, so, so these, are these 10, these, right. these big 10 are the ones that uh, not only right. document your position, but then show, hey, what goes in place of it? Right. Don't take something away without putting something in place of it. And what you put in place of it is mm -hmm. the center of the universe. So we have then this evidence of the galaxies moving away and there is a center. And what do we associate with the center? Psalm 11, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His kingdom rules over all. We're associating then this center with right. the throne of God. So that's looking now from the science, now moving to the authority of God's word and saying, huh, there's a center and having that idea is not only scientific, but there are some things about God's word that we want to look at now. And we want to say, hey, what is God's word saying about this? And that's what we're going to look at in our next little segment here when we come back. So we're glad that you've joined us. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Bob Gentry, and he's relating to us the research that he and David have done concerning the center of the universe. And uh, what we've discovered is, is there's many scientific reasons to um, <laughs> posit a center of the universe, which we won't enumerate again now, but we're going to make a shift now and look at another source of authority, that being the Bible and what it has to say about this important subject. And so, Dr. Gentry, you have a few texts that we want to just go through and, and talk about them just very briefly and just let this other body of information kind of speak for itself. That's right. Well, here again in Psalm 11, 4a, the Lord is in his holy temple the Lord's throne is in heaven. So there's the, there there gives a location. Okay. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. And of course that word established is uh, an established point uh, is the suggestion there. That's the suggestion I have that indeed the center has actually, um, so to speak, figured prominently in identifying where, you know, the throne of, of God really is at the present time. And in the video, of course, we arrived at the conclusion at the, in the video that this place is also where judgment is going on according to the book of Hebrews, which we're going to look at in just a minute. And this is one of the passages. That's that the, kind of the about. center of the book of Hebrews. It's the center, central passage, Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So that's the main point, saying he's right there on the throne. That's right. It's emphasizing an aspect of Christ's ministry, as far as I can tell, at the present time. 
Again, yeah. then in Hebrews 10, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body. In other words, there's something about what is going on in the sanctuary at the present time, this most holy place, that as far as I can tell, you know, must have some great significance at the present time. And it goes along with this idea of that Daniel talks about there'd be a judgment. And That's right. Um, there would be a judgment that was based on the law of God, which is there, of course, um, in the heavenly sanctuary in the most holy place. Well, of course, we're seeing here, you know, pictorial representation of, indeed, the Ark of the Covenant, the law being taken out of the Ark of the Covenant, and indeed, of course, uh, Christ representing his intercession there for someone who is, figuratively speaking, standing before the law. Mm -hmm. So, um, this first covenant that we see there, it says, had an earthly sanctuary set up in the first room with a lampstand, the table, the bread, called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place which had the golden altar of incense, the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant, contained Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. So that's the center again. Let's look again. What's our next text that we're looking at? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In other words, He is there from the beginning, like you did in your first research. Um, he's the one that created the world, and you did that as you looked at the granites, and he's also the center, is what you're suggesting. Yes, and these passages, you know, are very, very well known by most Christians, and if we look at them carefully, it says, without him was not anything made that was, that made. was made. Really placing his stamp of approval on the fact that all this business about we're coming from who knows where, it's him that made us all. Him has life. The life was the light of men. And it says, in the beginning with God. And in the beginning was the word, uh, referring now to in the beginning in Genesis, of course, that's referring to the beginning of the creation, meaning in my understanding that in the beginning of the creation there in Genesis, it's referring to a particular point in time because, as we said before, it picks up in the fourth commandment, then indeed, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see in all that in them is. So the question is, what are we talking about when it says all that in them is? There is something, something I believe, that relates to that part of the universe that was actually part of the creation. And of course, where is Christ going to come from? My understanding is it is from heaven, heaven, the throne, and it deals with the uh, second coming. My understanding again is that the second coming is a time, you know, where we all, one way or the other, are going to reap the rewards of the consequences of our lives here in this world. So, you, we've looked at these texts, and then I have a question for you, and that question is, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, in the beginning He created all things. Then how can you say, Dr. Gentry, in your model of the universe, the Genesis model, that there were pre-existing galaxies or other world, so to speak? Get into that, Willis. Well, that's a very, very, uh, a most penetrating question because the whole issue here that we're saying basically is that we take away the Big Bang, we take away a geologic evolution, we take away a biologic evolution, and we've got this new model of the universe that fits the observations, of course, that were previously explained by the Big Bang. And it tells us things about the universe that we didn't know before, characteristics. And we have the evidence of creation in the rocks. We have evidence, in a sense, of God's fingerprints creation in the universe, the galaxies spreading out from a point. But there are these questions, as you are bringing to us here. All right, let's look at these passages here. To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens which were of old then the next one and the other translation Again. in the new king james version now to him who rides on the heaven of heavens which were of old and then the niv to him who rides on the heaven of heavens which were of old and again rsv to him who rides in the heavens the ancient heavens okay and then nasb to him who rides upon the highest heavens 
which are from the ancient times. Okay, well, are there other heavens mentioned? Well, we're going to take a look at this. Revelation 21, 1. I saw a new heaven, okay, the ancient versus the new, and a new earth for the first heaven, and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. A new heaven, new earth, that's yet to come. Right. The first heaven and the first earth, connecting heaven, that first heaven and the first earth are connected. Right. Just says so very clearly. So we've got a connection between the earth and heaven. the first heaven. Mm -hmm. First earth, first heaven. Okay, what All are right? we next? Now, as we go on... Uh, then well, we look patriarchs at, and prophets. How will we say, why would I introduce this? Okay, and this, uh, this of course, is uh, of the writings of Ellen White, when Seventh-day Adventists uh, proclaim that she had the gift of prophecy and that she had special insights. So reading from her, as commonly used, the term laws of nature comprises what men have been able to discover with regard to the laws that govern the physical world. But how limited is their knowledge and how vast the field in which the Creator can work in harmony with His own laws and yet wholly beyond the comprehension of finite beings. So you're saying that there are some things we can understand, but she's suggesting there might be some that are beyond us. Of course, we wouldn't understand them then. Well, <laughs> basically, you know, this is not much different than what Newton said. You know, there's a vast, vast field out there and I've just barely scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. And so... What we want to be careful of, what I'm just bringing this out for is so that as we now delve into this aspect of trying to relate the universe with the spiritual, that we need to be careful that we don't say, well, this can't be because of some laws of nature that we see here in this world. Because miracles, other things God has done in the past, in fact, creation itself, I mean, he creates and then works within laws, but he can, he can uh, supersede them anytime he wants. Exactly. Yet men of science think that they can comprehend the wisdom of God, that which he has done or can do. The idea largely prevails that he is restricted by his own laws. Men either deny or ignore his existence or think to explain everything, even the operation of his spirit upon the human heart, and they no longer reverence his name or fear his power. They do not believe in the supernatural, not understanding God's laws or his infinite power to work his will through them. Let me just make a comment there. You see, in the real world, which you're very, very familiar with, this whole issue of creation and evolution, for example, mm -hmm. in the public schools and so forth, the evolutionists get up day after day and said, you know, we can't let that happen because there's no scientific evidence for creation. We're going to teach them true science, the truth. And what we're basically saying here is that the true science, the truth is that evolution is wrong, but at the same time, we also understand that if the Creator is putting something here for us to understand, there's got to be a spiritual element to it. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand that what we have found within the laws of nature, that's well, fine, and good. But if you're going to understand anything about the Creator, the infinite God, there's got to be some things here that will not be necessarily explainable from the standpoint of, you know, ordinary laws. Uh, Acts 7, 55 and 56 says, But <clears throat> he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, Behold... I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, that's certainly helped by the Holy Spirit to be able to see from heaven to earth. Well, that's <laughs> right. But there's another reason, of course, why I put this here, because the whole issue of the Sabbath being a memorial of the creation of the universe, which is what we said in the presentation video, uh, immediately raises the question. Some people have said, well, wait a minute, that can't be because, you know, the universe is 10 billion light years, and so therefore it could not possibly the light can possibly have come here even within 6,000 years. And so I'm bringing this out to show that indeed, within the framework of the Bible, that indeed it says that Stephen was actually seeing the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Actually light from the throne of God coming down virtually instantaneously. With the Holy Spirit's help. Absolutely. Okay. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter, and this is talking about the transfiguration James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His raiment became shining, exceeding white, exceedingly white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them, and a fuller is someone that makes things white. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and the voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. We're going to go now from uh, the Bible to a quotation from the book Desire of Ages about that particular event. 
about the transfiguration, transfiguration. Where, the, where, where heaven was kind of open for them. That's right. Uh, let's read it. Only the three who are to witness his anguish in Gethsemane have been chosen to be with him on the mount. Now the burden of his prayer is that they may be given a manifestation of the glory he had with the Father before the world was. His prayer is heard. While he is bowed in the lowliness on the stony ground, suddenly the heavens open. The golden gates of the city of God are thrown wide, and holy radiance descends upon the mount, enshrouding the Savior's form. And that is, in order for that light to come down to earth, the gates of the city had to be thrown open. Both for Stephen now and then for those on the Mount of Transfiguration, same thing has happened. Divinity from within flashes through humanity and meets the glory coming from above. That's an interesting statement. Arising from his prostrate position, Christ stands in godlike majesty. The soul agony is gone. His countenance now shines as the sun, and his garments are white as the light. Desire of Ages 420-421. So that's a, that's a picture of this uh, possibility of seeing the very uh, center of the universe in two passages. Look at this. We're, we're again dealing with this book by Ellen White, uh, Desire, Desire of Ages. Ages. Uh, and is now we're dealing, we're going to go jumping from these two particular instances. We understand, of course, uh, there was a great controversy going on prior to the time that it happened in this world. Okay, so this is looking now from another perspective in the universe. To the angels in the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Satan led men into sin and the plan of redemption was put into operation. 4,000 years, Christ was working for man's uplifting and Satan for his ruin and degradation. And the heavenly universe beheld it all. So there is some kind of watching from another point in the universe. Whatever is going on, there's a transmission of information from the vast reaches of the universe, wherever these unfallen beings are at the present time, to us. Virtually, it says watching. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're seeing something going on in real time. So, the, the, I mean, the Bible would make the same point in Corinthians. We are a spectacle to Absolutely. men and to angels. And then... Uh, Ellen White is not particularly alone on this uh, suggestion, but it, it, it's an excellent quote. Well, we're, the, the reference here is to the angels and the unfallen worlds. Unfallen worlds. Now, in uh, Job, as we will know, of course, there's this discussion between God and Lucifer, and he's saying, and there are these beings, sons of God, who have come in from as representatives of the unfallen worlds, as far as I can tell. And so basically I'm saying that there is a biblical understanding of indeed sons of God representing obviously if there's a son of God in this world and Adam was the son of God in this world by the son of God we infer, I do at least, that there were other worlds prior and we know this as far as we can tell is the only world that has fallen and so by implication then there were these sons of God that came in for this meeting there with about Job and so forth these were the representatives of the, quote, unfallen worlds. And this is, okay, let's go to our next, but I can see that you're providing a basis to look at the, uh, the outer edge of the universe. Yes. The 144,000 shouted, hallelujah, as they recognized their friends who had been torn from them by death. And in the same moment, we are changed and caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. We all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass when Jesus brought the crowns and with his own right hand placed them on our heads. This is from the book called Early Writings, page 16. So there's an intergalactic flight, if you will, from earth to heaven. Um, and it's talking about space travel. Even from here to Orion is 1,500 light years. And this is taking seven days. And who knows, but there might be a, a side trip around the universe. So obviously the trip itself is going to be going at you know multiple times the speed of light mm -hmm. in order for this to occur. Patriarchs and Prophets, another uh, insight here. Lucifer, as the anointed chariot, had been highly exalted. He was greatly loved by the heavenly beings, and his influence over them was strong. God's government included not only the inhabitants of heaven, but of all the worlds that he had created. And Lucifer had concluded that if he could carry the angels of heaven with him in rebellion, he could carry also all the worlds. So there are another insight into this other worlds. Um, 
that indeed, you know, there was something was going on, obviously. Um, in heaven it took place, he was expelled, but he wanted to carry these other worlds with him, and also all the worlds that he had created. And so the question is, where does that fit? Where are these worlds fitting in with respect to our the creation? That's right. The king of the universe summoned the heavenly host before him, and in their presence, he that he might set forth the true position of his son and show the relation he sustained to all created beings. The Son of God shared the Father's throne and the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled both. About the throne gathered the holy angels a vast unnumbered throng, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, Revelation 5.11. The most exalted angels as ministers and subjects rejoicing in the light that fell upon them from the presence of the deity. The Son of the Father had wrought the Father's will in the creation of the host of heaven, and to him, as well as to God, their homage and allegiance was due. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants, but in this he would not seek power or exaltation for himself, contrary to God's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute his purposes of beneficence and love. Page first and prophets, page thirty-six. So all these quotes. There were a couple of quotes there. They were all demonstrating that he's in the center, um, or that he is in the presence of God. And there were there. He was there when the worlds were created. And, and that's right. Now this particular one is uh, something very, very specific. It says the Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of the hosts of heaven and to him and so forth. Their homage and allegiance were due. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. While so ago, in other words, they were created, and then this was before the world was created, the earth right. was created. And remember we read a while ago, you know, connecting the biblical passage, connecting the earth with the creation of the heavens. Right. And so basically I'm saying if we use this, then there is this separation between what had been wrought out in days gone by, years gone by, whenever, and also the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. Mm -hmm. So there's a separation as far as I can tell. And so then. Revelation 12, 7 through 9, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then commenting on that, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, page 17. And I saw that when God said to his son, Let us make man in our image, Satan was jealous of Jesus. He wished to be highest in heaven next to God and received highest honors. Until this time, all heaven was in order, harmony, and perfect subjection to the government of God. So what you're suggesting here is that uh, <laughs> it was over the creation of the world that they got into a rift between Satan and Jesus and so there were existing planets and there were other things that had happened and then uh, the creation of the world came about. Yes, because I understand that, you know, we are a special creation in a sense. We have this capability of procreation that the other worlds, you know, had at least some knowledge of the, what had happened with Lucifer and so forth. But and anyway, going here, um, let us make man in our image. It specifies to me, at least, that must have been on day six of creation week. Mm. He was cast out. Interesting. So, where do we take it from there? War in heaven. Warned the fate of those who had been there with them. And then it says, the father consulted his son in regard to at once carrying out their purpose to make man to inhabit the earth. Same follow-up of what we just got through reading. That indeed, uh, it was when... Christ and the Father consulted with respect to making man, and that's when everything just sort of blew up. In Patriarchs and Prophets, then continuing, the laws and operations of nature, which have engaged men's study for 6,000 years, were opened to their minds by the infinite framer and upholder of all. God's glory in the heavens, the innumerable worlds and their orderly revolutions, the balancing of the clouds, the mysteries of the light and sound of day and night, all were open to the study of our first parents. So here they were studying what had happened before. And my understanding is <clears throat> they're studying what has recently been created. They're part mm -hmm. of what they are studying. All the treasures of the universe will open to the study of God's redeemed, unfettered by mortality. They wing their tireless flights of the worlds afar, 
worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of the redeemed soul. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and wisdom of the unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. In other words, as far as I can tell, it's pointing out here that there were these beings who had, you know, already been around for a long period of time, had gained this knowledge prior to the time, ages upon ages, before the time of mm. the resurrection, so to speak. Interesting. And this is all, you know, making the case that they're, as you've looked at the cosmological structure, you've said, look, there is a pre <laughs> existence of uh, an, uh, at the outer ring there there are galaxies that were created before our galaxy scientifically that's what is required to build this new cosmic model of the universe I found that and then I actually came across these statements about the ancient heavens so scientifically it makes sense but also now within the other source of authority that many operate within uh, that being the Bible and then for Seventh-day Adventists within the writings of Ellen White you can make the case there for the same cosmological model. Let's look at another one. The Great Controversy, page 676. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of the creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, in, and in all the riches of His power displayed. Now, is this looking back then? I believe this, of course, you know, is at the end of the Great Controversy, right. and it's all over. And it's saying what is going to be happening, and for sure, it says all things are circling the throne of deity. Mm, That's got to be the center. Circling the throne of deity. And my... I don't think uh, you're... That, that makes sense, doesn't it? Circling the throne of deity. So the new heavens and the new earth are going to be constructed differently than the present time, because the new heavens and the new earth... For example, if you had this uh, way of formatting the universe at the present time but everything's circling the galaxies are so far out and indeed there the Doppler effect and so forth would hardly be noticeable at all but what I'm saying is that the way that it is formatted at the present time it was actually created in such a way that is inescapable with the Hubble redshift relation to point out that there is a center mm -hmm. and indeed if there for sure is going to be a center in the new heavens and the new earth my thought is indeed this is an additional indication that Wherever that center is, then obviously we'll be back on earth. That's the way the Lord uh, did it the first time as well. Again, another statement, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 115, speaking <clears throat> of the heaven of heavens. Thou, even thou, O Lord, alone, thou hast made the heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and all things therein. And thou hast preserved them all, Nehemiah 9, 6. As regards this world, God's work of creation is completed. For the works were finished from the foundation of the word, world, Hebrews 4.3. Well, his energy <clears throat> is still exerted in unfolding the objects of his creation. Yeah, the point is here, of course, that the creation was not complete until the earth. In other words, the present circumstance, the present universe, his act of creation is now completed. Uh, aside from a few other passages here about the heaven and heaven of heavens, simply to describe that indeed there is the earthly earth there's the earth and there's the visible heavens which we can see and then um, the heaven of heavens which of course is where God's throne itself is located that's the heavenly sanctuary which we are unable to see at the present time the other passages here referred to in 2 Corinthians as far as I can tell Paul is I mean the Bible is simply helping us to understand that the heaven of heavens, the third heaven and so forth, are isolating, being isolated from the visible heavens that we can see and this invisible heavens that we cannot see as far as I can tell. So we looked at all of these texts before in the prophets about mm. how Isaiah talked about the heavens and earth were stretched out, how the, the heavens and the, all of their hosts were commanded and they stretched out and there was this expansion. Um, uh, in all those passages in Isaiah we've considered. Um, and this is making sense with your model of cosmology. It's simply telling us, as far as I can say, with all these passages that are referring to the center, that it, um, the Lord wanted to try to convey to us something of importance. 
mm -hmm. created the heavens, formed the earth, made it, established it, created not in vain. And uh, the implication again is that I think that the way in which the universe was constructed was for this particular purpose. For example, if indeed the, universe, the throne, for example, were wandering around and there was a center and the throne was out some other distant place, you could ask the question that if in the new heavens and the new earth everything is going to revolve around the throne, the center, why this particular point in the universe would be isolated by this Hubble relationship. In other words, the entire universe was constructed, had to be constructed to actually point to that one particular point nearby. So another statement from Manuscript 73, 1886, page 238. When we returned at midnight, the same scenes continued, but for all the hundreds of stars <coughs> across the heavens, we could not miss one. Not a single glory in the starry host seemed to be missing. The following nights, we had no such scene repeated. God's host still shines in the firmament of the heaven. And then next, Review and Herald, October 27. He who laid the foundation of the earth, who garnished the heavens and marshaled the stars in their order, he who has clothed the earth would have his children appreciate his works. Again, we have the foundation of the earth garnished the heavens, mm. something we can see. And then the uh, text from the Bible, Psalm 115, 3, but our God is in the heavens, he hath done whatsoever he pleased. And the same, Psalm 103, verse 19, the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. See, as far as I can tell, again, the idea of the throne, the kingdom ruling, obviously, from the throne. Ministry of Healing, page 419. In the heavens above, in the earth, in the broad waters of the ocean, we see the handiwork of God. All created things testify to his power, his wisdom, his love. Yet not from the stars or the ocean or the cataract can we learn of the personality of God as it was revealed in Christ. So whatever we can learn, it's transcended by That's right. That Christ. first part of that, of that first sentence, in the heavens above, in the earth, waters, we see the handiwork. Again, the implication, as far as I can tell, that God did something specific, earth, heavens, and so forth, to actually help people to understand He is the Creator. Through the fourth commandment, the attention of man is called to the power of the finite hand that placed the stars in the firmament. If they had obeyed this commandment, they would have worshipped God as they looked at the sun that rules the day and the moon which rules the night. Now the first part of that, the fourth commandment is the one that calls attention to creation. And then manuscript 96, 1899, God calls men to look upon the heavens, see him in the wonders of the starry heavens. We are not merely to gaze upon the heavens, we are to consider the works of God. He would have us study the works of uh, infinity, and from this study, learn to love and reverence and obey him. The heavens and the earth with their treasures are to teach the lessons of God's love, care, and power. Mm. Again, look at the heavens, wonders of the starry heavens, there's something there to consider the works of God. So that's obviously what we've been talking about. How little time, Manuscript 96, 1899, how little time and thought are given to the creator of the heavens of the earth. God calls upon his creatures to turn their attention from the confusion and perplexity around them and admire his handiwork. That's what's happening with Hubble, isn't it? The heavenly Sorry. bodies are worthy of contemplation. God has made them for the benefit of men. And as we study his works, angels will be by our side. That's a great promise. And our whole attention in this country is being directed there by these amazing discoveries that then can be carried to any computer in, in almost seconds. God has made them for the benefit of man. What uh, occurs to me at that point is Jesus said the certain day was made for the benefit of man. man. And, the, and the stars and the create, created things as well. So what I'm getting from these statements is that the Lord is trying to help people, all of us, understand that as we look at the heavens, we should be thinking about the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath. It's all pointing toward Him, Creator, and that particular point in day and time. That's what I think all this that He has put here in the universe, as we as Seventh-day Adventists have an opportunity to point to the people of the world and say, 
You can't do any better. The fourth commandment is there in the heavenly sanctuary, and here it is in the universe um, for, the, for our benefit, so to speak. And then letter 79, 1897. The sun and the moon were made by him. There is not a star that beautifies the heavens, which he did not make. Boy, that's completely opposite of what <laughs> theories that you hear today. Yeah. Uh, it's very clear that it's just calling attention to him again. And then counsels regarding the medical work, page 373. Jesus Christ is the true creator of all things. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The psalmist bears witness, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and to night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So the days, seven days of creation, they utter forth. And then the stars, and that which is made, utters forth. The heavens are declaring the glory of God in a way that perhaps we haven't thought of before. Then lift him up as creator, page 54. The creator has given abundant evidence that his power is unlimited. He upholds the world by the word of his power. He made the night, marshalling the shining stars in the firmament. He calls them all by name. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, showing men that this little world is but a jot in God's creation. Hmm powerful statements. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 116. Yet, the works of creation testify of God's power and greatness. The heavens declare again, quoting Psalm 19, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So, a fulfillment of that text as we look at the evidence from Hubble and all those different things pointing our attention, centering us back again to the Creator and to the person that established the Ten Commandments. Now well, this one, I think, um, it just really stands out in a sense. Our high God. calling, page 193. Behold the glories of the firmament. Look up to the gems of light which, like precious gold, stud the heavens. Cannot he who spread above us this glorious canopy, who, if the sun, moon, and stars were swept away, could call them again into existence in a moment. Wow. Yeah, two hundred, at least 200 billion galaxies, and at least 200 billion stars in each galaxy. And in a and moment. Hmm. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 50. Adam and Eve were visited by angels and were granted communion with their Maker with no obscuring veil between. The mysteries of the visible universe, the wondrous works of Him which is perfect in knowledge, afforded them an exhaustless source of instruction and delight. Now, to me, the um, essence of what we're talking about here in the context of our presentation is the mysteries of the visible universe. Mm -hmm. You see, the outer galactic shell cannot be seen. The cosmic black body radiation comes from that. It's redshifted, but you can't see it. What is being referred to here is the mysteries of the the visible universe. Mm, interesting distinction. Uh, reading these statements from a physicist's standpoint <laughs> is, a, is definitely interesting. Testimonies, volume 2, page 583. He set apart that special day for men to rest from his labor, that as he should look upon the earth beneath and the heavens above, he might reflect that God made all these in six days and rested upon the seventh, and that as he should behold the tangible proofs of God's infinite wisdom, his heart might be filled with love and reverence for his maker. Wow, so that's linking this looking at the heavens above with now the Sabbath as well. Look upon the earth beneath the heavens above. Mm -hmm. Made all these in six days. Wow. So that's, that's what I, you know, searched for years and years and years of consistency. How could there be other worlds prior to creation week and that statement be true? And so anyway. Patriots and Prophets, page 78 and 79. The holy inhabitants of other worlds were watching with deepest interest the events taking place on the earth. In the condition of the world that existed before the flood, they saw illustrated the results of the administration which Lucifer had endeavored to establish in heaven in rejecting the authority of Christ and casting aside the law of God. 
So now we've drawn our attention to um, the creation of the stars and then connected that with the Sabbath. But now we're looking at uh, this opening in the space of Orion that many who have read the writings of Ellen White, of course, would be familiar with. Dark, heavy clouds came upon and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. And then we could look up through the open space in Orion. Whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. And of course, there's the Orion Nebula in the background there. That's why we chose the trip from Earth to Orion going, going through the Orion Nebula. For the last animation there. I had a very, very good friend, uh, an astronomer who worked uh, at the Naval Research Laboratory, and he wrote a book on Orion. And his uh, thoughts, I believe, are very, very relevant to what we're talking about here today, and I'd like for us to concentrate briefly on those thoughts. Okay, John A. Isley. 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 Dominating the vista high above the southern horizon constellation in the heavens, Orion, the mighty hunter. In fact, Orion is foremost from every point of view. It is truly an orchid among the stars. As an object of beauty, it has no peer. It is the most brilliant of the constellations, and it is visible from every inhabited part of the world. On the whole, the constellation of Orion is the richest and most impressive of all the constellations. The region below or toward the east, like that toward the west, has only a few bright stars, which enhances even more the splendor of the sky in the vicinity of Orion. In my opinion, God is deliberately attracting our attention to the direction of Orion and the great Orion Nebula, that wonderful place that has fascinated astron astronomers for hundreds of years. The nebula beckons to us like a burning bush in the sky, and it commands our serious interest and intense study. I believe it to be a unique and important training ground for spiritual as well as physical truth. Please bear in mind, that in all fairness to the work of a messenger and prophet of God, that the famous claimed whole or open space in Orion need not be fully formed or completely developed until, the needed by, until needed by our Lord in the near future. The magnificent corridor is being prepared and finished at the present time by our, our Lord himself. His principal, principal physical tool in this important endeavor is the pressure that light exerts in pushing away the gas and dust from between the trapezium stars at the center of the nebula, yes, you can rest assured that it will be ready when needed. After all, the vision that Ellen White had is about the future and most definitely not about her own period of time or the past. And at the proper time, there will be no question in anybody's mind that she was right all along. Ellen White has mentioned the open space in Orion once exp explicitly and has alluded to it many times in her various other books, and it has also been reported by ancient and modern scientists alike. Ellen White's use of the phrase, the open space, was in harmony with similar usage of the expression by the famous German-English astron astronomer Sir William Herschel. He referred to the Loch in Himmel which in German means for the hole in heaven. Sir William Herschel actually discovered about 50 such holes in the heaven, but this is by far the most important one. And so it appears that the Lord gave Ellen White the appropriate words to use at the proper time so that both her contemporary and future readers would have an understanding and appreciate it. It is my belief that God can be expected to return to the earth from the most beautiful direction in space. He is giving us all reasonable hints. It is therefore not unreasonable to expect the obvious when it happens. And I think in many subtle ways, God is attracting the whole world's attention to this direction in the sky and that he is using modern secular science as an indisputable witness. There is abundant evidence of something very special happening there. Orion and its surroundings will be constantly monitored for the next few decades by both professional and amateur scientists. Therefore, the people on Earth should not be surprised by future events when they 
do occur. Fascinating. Right. I mean, that's uh, who is this man? He's a he's scientist a friend science, of yours. Yes, he's actually passed away now, and he wrote that in the 1980s. Mm. All right, the late 1980s. Now on the left over there, you see what is what the astronomers have called the hand of God. Mm, I see it. Now, it's all like a hand. All right. Now that appeared. That photograph appeared on the front cover of Nature magazine back in 1993, and indeed the astronomers at the Anglo Australian Observatory saw this, you know, explosion or whatever we want to call it, and they looked at it and they said, it looks like a hand. Now, these men were not obviously Christians, they were atheists, agnostics, but they gave it the, the title, the hand of God. And as things have progressed, and of course there's the Orion Nebula over there on the right, you can see what part, of course, it's specifying is part of the Orion Nebula for this hand of God. Recently, there's been even more. And here's another quote by John. At the present time, the scientific community is conducting the most intensive study of Orion by using the latest equipment in space. This represents a very large investment of human effort and resources and may indicate that more than just simple scientific curiosity is involved in driving the research forward. I strongly believe that the Holy Spirit is actually leading out here. Remember I said that John wrote this in the late 80s, that photograph or that event there of the Orion Nebula and the occurred? hand of God occurred in 1993. Mm. Now, people may say, well, wait a minute, you know, that's impossible for it to be real time because it would take, you know, several thousand light years and so forth for the light to get here. The point of what we've been saying is that indeed the Lord is doing something beyond, quote, natural laws as we presently understand them in this life or in the present time in order for that light to actually reach or the people in the other worlds to see or to hear to view, of course, what's going on. Is that unusual? Is that really unusual? Um, let me make a comment. In other words, some people may say, well, wait a minute, you're dealing with fairy tales and dealing with, you know, the rapid transmission of light and so forth, as we're talking about here today. And they would say, not knowing any more perhaps than they do, that in the Big Bang, you know, we're just dealing with pure science and speed of light that we know here and so forth. And the very fact of the matter is, that's not true at all. Part of the Big Bang Theory, which we've been discussing, and which we've indicated, of course, is resting on the false premises. Remember we talked about the expansion, space-time expansion right. of the universe? Mm -hmm. I remember that. Now, a feature of that which they do not mention is that presumably the expansion is taking place everywhere at the same time. Remember? Right. The universe right. is the same everywhere, right. so forth. But now stop and think. If indeed the universe is the same everywhere, that means that whatever expansion is going on right here in the environs of the Earth and the solar system is going on where? Everywhere. Everywhere. You know what that implies? Very, very clearly, although they don't like to mention it, instantaneous communication of the mm. expansion effects throughout the universe. You see, that's not only a million times the speed of light, that's billions and billions and billions of times the speed of light for there to be an instantaneous mm -hmm. expansion, a movement of everything throughout the universe. So when people, you know, would say, well, we can't believe this because, you know, you're talking about light, you know, coming from the vast reaches of the universe over a short, short period of time. And again, the reason they would say this is because they're going to judge that on the basis of the speed of light, of course, being a certain value, 186,000 miles a second, approximately here in this world. And they also are forgetting this, that indeed in nuclear physics, in nuclear physics, for example, atoms that are radioactive, uranium, for example, in order for an alpha particle emission to come out of a uranium nucleus, what has to happen, the theory is, and indeed, indeed there is a particle inside the nucleus. It can't get over the barrier in order to get out. If it could get over the barrier, all the particles would fly out instantly, and all the uranium atoms would decay instantly. The particle can impinge upon this barrier, which is vastly higher than the energy it actually has, and once in a while, Gets out. it actually goes out. It tunnels through. It's called tunneling. And so what I'm basically saying is, although I can't prove it, and I will freely admit that, but I'm saying is we have an example from the here and now in present day science that something that is impossible, meaning a particle coming out and surmounting a potential barrier that is vastly higher than the energy it has, it's happening every day, everywhere in the world where there are radioactive atoms. So basically I'm saying is 
that when the Lord created the universe, for Adam and Eve to be able to see, for us to be able to see the universe, the heavens declare the glory of God, what is happening is there is, as we all know, anyone who believes the Bible, I should say, there is another dimension. We believe there are angels, and the angels we obviously cannot see around us at the present time. There is another dimension to the universe, and basically what I'm saying is this other dimension, or maybe there's still a third dimension or a fourth dimension more than what we understand, it is through that other dimension that the light particles from the distant reaches of the universe are actually coming to us through a different part of what we would call the vacuum than we ordinarily experience in this world. In other words, the properties of the vacuum, the properties of the universe are actually different. Now, we can't go and ascertain that experimentally at the present time because we obviously, obviously are not there. But in terms of actually making a comparison between the improbabilities of the Big Bang and showing that indeed the fundamental premises there are incorrect and also realizing that Big Bang has always required instantaneous communication throughout the reaches of the universe, compare that to the statements we just read about beings in the other worlds actually being able to see what's going on here. There's no more, the, the model that we're talking about here has better has better uh, physical support, scientific support, than does a theory which never had any basis in fact at all, which means, of course, the space-time theory. Well, in this section, you know, we've talked about the other dimension. We looked at the science in the first section. In this section, we looked at applying what you've said can be uh, supported scientifically in your cosmological model to another source, that being scripture and the spirit of prophecy. We looked at those statements and we recognize that not only does it support your model, it also uh, answers some very significant questions. The primary question that we answered was what about the other worlds or other galaxies? And that, that question was answered. And then we moved to see also uh, that the statements concerning Orion that were made by the spirit of prophecy can also be seen to be, there's a lot of activity concerning Ryan, Orion, and we can see that, again, modern science is pointing uh, the finger, so to speak, uh, at Orion, and it is uh, pointing our attention to the fact that there is a center of the universe and that uh, very soon God uh, will descend through Orion, uh, as Ellen White indicated, and that the center of the universe is also the place where his law is kept and in the midst of his law is that commandment that points to uh, the creation and also the consummation. He created and he will come again. Thank you so much for joining us as we've been talking to Dr. Robert Gentry, Dr. Robert and David Gentry have spent a lot of their life looking at these very statements and they've seen the glories. I hope this expanded discussion has been helpful to you. And may God bless you as you con con continue to consider the wonders that he has made.